she forced herself to laugh at herself, at her silly numbskull self for getting excited over nothing, nothing, and forced herself to think about dinner and about the Netflix movie she and her husband would watch that night, and forced herself not to think about Malcolm, who, when he smiled, looked the same and completely different. The end. Wait a minute. <laughs> the reader says, is that all? Is that all? This is completely unsatisfying. The reader wants some fireworks, some passion, some tension, some arguing, some uncomfortable moments, something, anything that won't leave poor Naomi hanging there, living her same old life. It's not fair. But the writer refuses. I already gave her everything I don't have. I gave her a new job where no one knows and looks at her with pity. I gave her a husband who didn't leave her the moment she was diagnosed. I gave her Malcolm, who loves her. I even gave her all my old jokes. I gave her permission. What more do you want? Well, that shuts the reader right up. <laughs> uh, what the reader now knows about the writer changes the story completely. And the reader doesn't know what to think. The reader starts to say something, but the writer slams the door shut. The story seems to be over. But the reader continues to stand silently outside the writer's door. <laughs> the problem is that although the reader doesn't want to be pushy, you know, given the writer's circumstances, <laughs> the reader still wants to know about Naomi. That's what was promised in the first few paragraphs. That's why the reader's been reading. Finally, the writer shoves a paper under the door. <laughs> she has in this story, good or bad, it needs to be done. Late at night, with the dishwasher swishing downstairs and her husband snoring next to her, Naomi does think of Malcolm. His strong shouldered stoop, <laughs> his clean shaven face, his dark brown eyes. She allows herself feelings of yearning She imagines taking her clothes off for him, standing naked before him, and the cancer doesn't matter. He sees her for who she is and doesn't flinch at all as she says, touch my breasts. She says, please. She says, touch me. This battered trumpet belonged to my father, who once had pretensions of being a jazz musician. Now, I don't know how long he held on to this dream, but I know that by the time I was 10, he wasn't playing anymore. He would sit on the roof and drink, drink and sob, holding the trumpet like some talisman against the night, and he would finger the notes, play whole songs without blowing into it once. I don't know what he might have sounded like in the days when the dreams burned intensely in him, but I know this. Some of those breathless songs he played on the roof at night, tears running down his face and salt and alcohol on his lips were probably the best things he ever played. 